Chapter 24, Industry Comes of Age, 1865 to 1900. So this is the second in a series of three or four chapters that cover the exact same time period. So you saw in the last chapter it was all about the politics, the, the different administrations, the different some of the laws that were passed. Um, this focuses on the second wave of the Industrial Revolution. And when we say the second wave, they're, they're not two distinct waves. Um, it's just that your book and the history classes tend to break it apart because they talk about the civil war in between, uh, civil war and the aftermath in between the two of them. But as we know, that the Industrial Revolution really starts during the War of 1812, and it really starts with, with the textile industry, the textile mills. Uh, then the the railroad is invented in about the 1830s or so, and it's it's a really slow process. But during the Civil War and the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, it really ramps up. You see, for the, this, the entirety of this age, then, uh, America really shifts from an agricultural powerhouse to an industrial powerhouse. All right, the uh, causes of rapid industrialization during this time period. And there's ten of them, or at least I say that there's ten of them. Uh, the, the first one is the steam revolution that occurs uh, really starting in about the 1830s, but it continues all th throughout the 1850s as well. And, you know, we talk about a lot it, with the railroad industry, but it's also occurring in the textile mills as well and in other early factories where you're harnessing uh, steam to turn pistons to actually, you know, they, that turns the, uh, does the horsepower. We talked about a little bit already with uh, ferries and the and the, the, the canals and, and rivers. We already talked about the railroad. The railroad, we're going to, you know, in the next slide or so, we're going to even spend more time because the railroad industry is really what spurs the rest of the industrialization, really ramps it up exponentially. Technological innovations. You know, we're going to talk a lot about not just the railroad, but, you know, there's so many other inventions that occurred during this time period. And these inventions, they create jobs and they create uh, ancillary industries, so other factories that their their sole purpose is to crank out semi-manufactured goods that go to this now central factory to create manufactured goods to create these technological innovations. Uh, I have here four and five. Unskilled labor will be four and semi-skilled labor will be number five. Um, we have massive amounts of immigration, which means that it was real easy for a factory owner to hire tons of people for very cheap. So the, the wages are kept very low which means that he can invest this money into other things. Abundant capital. Not only was the U.S. government loaning money, especially to the railroads, uh, not only were American banks loaning money to these industrialists, uh, but the rest of the world, especially Europe, was really pumping in millions and millions of dollars in loans to private corporations in the United States because the returns were so good. I have here a new talented group of businessmen or entrepreneurs uh, and advisors. Uh, this is the, the guy up here is John D. Rockefeller. Um, this is the age of the robber barons if you're kind of a pro working class or the age of the captains of industry if you're a capitalist. So Zinn would call them robber barons and Schweikart would call them captains of industry. Uh, but whether they were ruthless and whether or not they were evil, they were super skilled and they did help uh, America become an economic powerhouse thanks to the Adam Smith invisible hand. Market growing as the US population increased. Just the simple fact that you have more people in a country means that you have more people that are going to buy stuff and so that creates the demand in and of itself. The government was willing to help at all levels to stimulate economic growth. We already talked a little bit about the, the loans to the railroads. They also give you know land grants as well. But this is the, the era of laissez-faire economics. Laissez-faire meaning uh, hands-off. The government had virtually no regulation whatsoever uh, of the, the, the economy. And this is good if you're a businessman because you're completely unencumbered with laws. You don't have to worry about... Uh, workplace safety, you don't have to worry about uh, collusion or monopolies or anything like that. You can just go nuts. Uh, if you're the working class uh, and the consumer, you can kind of get screwed. But it's it's very good to, at building up an economy. And abundant natural resources. We're just lucky. 
that uh, we got tons of coal, tons of iron ore, tons of lumber, tons of water, um, tons of arable land. Uh, it, it's just we kind of lucked out in the geographical. Okay, so shifting now to the the railroad. In the 1860s, the federal government uh, begins to advance uh, tons and tons of money to railroad companies. Remember, they had been talking since really the 1840s of building a transcontinental railroad. And there was that dispute between the North and the South. Is it going to be the Northern Line? Is it going to be the Southern Line? We made the Gadsden Purchase to aid the Southern Line. And you got Stephen, Stephen Douglas then for greedy reasons that helped Chicago uh, is able to secure the Northern Line, but that, that gives us the Kansas-Nebraska Act and all that other stuff. So basically they, they start finally constructing this line in the 1860s. It's, it's an absolutely massive expenditure. The federal government themselves aren't the ones that are building it. They're private corporations. So how the federal government helped these corporations is that they gave them money. In addition to that, they gave them massive land grants on either side of the proposed railroad tracks. And this was really even more valuable than the money because the railroad companies could use this land in two ways. They could use it as collateral to get loans from uh, domestic sources or from European sources. And they could also then sell that land to individuals or to speculators. Think about it this way. If, if you have a, a railroad line going through the middle of absolute nowhere, Utah, uh, that land still has value. But if there's no railroad line there, that land has virtually no value because you can't grow anything there. But if you have a train station there, now we're talking. And so it's a win-win situation. People are going to migrate west. The government is you know, getting all the economic benefits of the railroad. And the, that land, it, it's, it's getting value almost from nowhere. This is a table from your book. It shows you... You know how widespread our railroad lines are by 1889 compared to the rest of the world. You can see we have more than half of the entire world's uh, uh, railroad lines during this time period. So who's building it? Well, it, it's built during the Civil War, and so they call it the Union Pacific because of the Union Army and the Union is where the North was. And it starts from Omaha, Nebraska, and they construct it, you know, towards the west. They're using almost all Irish laborers. On the other hand, from Sacramento, the Central Pacific Railroad uh, starts to build eastward. The idea was that the two railroad tracks were going to meet up, and they got paid uh, for every mile of track that they laid. So that was the the incentive for them to build as fast as possible. Uh, the the Central Pacific Railroad used Chine Chinese. Uh, laborers. They met in Utah in 1869. This is a photograph of the meeting of the two railroad lines. This is then an ad from your book for the event, May 10th, 1869. And you can see it also is an ad then to use the railroad line. It has your passenger trains leave Omaha through to San Francisco. You know, talk about how nice the cars are. Uh, they're trying to advertise and get all the gold, the silver, and other miners that are trying to move out west to strike it rich, uh, and then just other stuff as well. This is a political cartoon talking about this time period where these different railroad companies were just building as many lines as possible, not just the transcontinental lines, but within states as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about this guy, Cornelius Vanderbilt, uh, in a second. So the next question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is the impact now of the the railroads, uh, the railroads in general and the transcontinental line in, in particular? And there's several answers to that. The first one is it brought together the West and the East Coasts. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the Oregon Trail and you know the horse-covered wagons and walking on a horseback that that would take months and months and months through hostile Indian territory, through through the Rockies, through all the elements. Uh, it, it was essentially impossible to engage in any type of transcontinental economic activity but now because you got trains going back and forth every you know you can make the journey in a couple of days uh, you're able to do that and so it really brings together the west and the east coast it also opens up asia to east coast uh, 
stuff, right? To the factory goods and to get uh, Asian uh, merchandise because they, they can get it from a boat from Japan or China to probably San Francisco and then put it on a train and you can send it to New York within a matter of days and, and vice versa as well. Number two, it spurs further industrialization. It opens up new markets, which I just talked about with Asia. And also, you're able to transport raw materials to factories. You know, factories, they, they build stuff, and they need natural resources in order to do that, whether it be coal, iron ore, nickel, uh, just rock, stuff like that. That stuff is really heavy, and you need massive amounts of it. And it's really impractical to do that in a wagon, a horse-drawn wagon. So having railroad lines actually pull into factories, uh, now you're able to get this stuff from all over the continent uh, right on site to the factory. It creates a need for steel. In fact, the, the railroad industry uh, kind of gives birth to the steel industry. The, the first railroad lines were, were on iron rails and iron rusts, and it's brittle compared to steel, and they tended to be very dangerous. So once they invented steel, um, that really uh, aids to the railroad industry. So they were, you know, symbiotic partners. Uh, think about all of the bridges, you know, over any type of creek, river, uh, canyon. That that's all. Those are all steel. Increased agriculture. You're now able to bring agricultural products to markets from west to east, and then also all of those factories on the east coast. They're able to to ship their manufactured goods to farmers throughout the Midwest and the West. There's a time period where every year there seems to be a new invention agriculturally, whether it be the harvester, the reaper, tractor, stuff like that. Uh, that stuff is big, and you know it, it needs increased urbanization. Towns grew up around the tracks. You know, I, I talked about that. There is this actually creates value for desert land uh, out west. Uh, if you've ever been to Las Vegas, there's no reason why anybody should ever live there from a geographic standpoint there's there's no water there's no arable land it, all it is is desert but if you look at the topography it's the confluence of two uh, valleys and it just so happened that then two railroad tracks had an intersection there and so that turned into a, a fairly large train station where goods could be taken off of one line and put on another line and so the town grew up around that so, you know, that's that's not a unique story. Towns all over the West grew up around railroad stations. Cities could grow in the West. They they didn't have to have, uh, you know, close to, to natural sources of water or food because that can be brought in now. Increased immigration. Uh, not just domestic immigration from the East Coast, but remember these, these railroad companies are trying to sell this land that was given to them by... The, the federal government so that they could use this money to invest in the railroad. So they actually sent agents to Europe and they would advertise uh, to Europeans that they should migrate to the United States and purchase this cheap land out west. And in fact, the, the railroad companies would oftentimes even pay for their transportation over, over water and then obviously over train uh, to this land. The railroad companies actually changed the method of tracking time on earth. Uh, for forever right it uh you had to always ask for what local time was so right now in chicago it is 7:05 a.m. it's a steamy negative 14 degrees outside but you know 150 years ago it might be 7:05 in chicago and it could be 7:18 in joliet and 7:25 in gary as 6:30 in Chicago, you you never knew what time it was. You had to actually ask what the local time is whenever you 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 arrived into a separate village or town. Well, you can imagine for the railroad companies who are trying to, you know, sell tickets months ahead of time uh, for dozens, if not hundreds, of stops all across the nation. Uh, this is going to be impossible to figure out. You know, all the logistics involved with this with these various local times. So eventually they just kind of, the, the big railroad executives met up and they just decided they're going to split up the earth into 24 one-hour time zones, four of which uh, fall within the United States, uh, the continental United States. And they just said that that's what, we're going to start creating time and here's here's your official time starting now. 
and a lot of cities, you know, they kind of went nuts over this originally, thinking you know, that private companies can't just t change their time. But they all quickly fell in line because the railroads were so powerful and so important. Uh, seven, it creates the robber barons. You get the railroad investors were the initial ones. They won and they lost millions. Uh, Vanderbilt is the most famous of them, but there's there's several others. This because of the other industries that are supported by and needed by the railroads, it also helps to create uh, the first mega rich. You know, there's there's Carnegie. There's we already talked about Rockefeller. There's J.P. Morgan. There's a, a bunch of other guys as well. Gustavus. This is a map from your book. It shows you, first off, the time zones. It also shows you the, transcont the first transcontinental railroad. Here you can see the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific. And then in the subsequent decades, they built several more transcontinental railroads. Here's the infamous Southern Transcontinental Railroad through the Gadsden Purchase down there. Then they have another one, the Atlantic and Pacific. Then they got up here, the Northern Pacific. Even Canada getting on the action there with uh, the Canadian Pacific. You also can see in the, the pink area, these are the, the land-grant areas given to uh, the railroad companies. Okay. So we talked about good things that the, the railroad companies created. Now, there's some of the bad things. You have all of these... Uh, railroad companies and really none of them are owned by a single individual because they're so expensive to operate what you need is investors and the way investing works in a company is you purchase stock and so you're a part owner in the company if you own a share or more than one share of the stock and if the company is doing well and lots of people want to purchase that stock as a result the stock price goes up and if you initially bought it at a lower price and now it's at a higher price you sell the stack you make money if the company is doing poorly uh, and a lot of people want to sell their stack uh, there's a chance well the, the, the value of the stack will go down the price will go down and you could probably lose money so if you're an insider in the railroad company and you want to make a quick buck uh, there's certain ways that you can manipulate the price of that stack uh, nowadays illegally and the 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 first, the, I should say the most well-known one, uh, is called stock watering. And it even predates corporations. Uh, the term stock watering comes from ranchers and middlemen who would bring livestock and you would get paid by the, the weight of the livestock. And so on the day of the weigh-in, they would secretly feed their livestock uh, tons of salt. And then the livestock would become so thirsty that they would then drink massive amounts of water. Then you hurry up, you take them to the the guy you're selling them to, they weigh them. They're artificially heavier because of all the water weight. You, you take your money, you get the hell out of there, and uh, very shortly after that, the livestock then piss away all of that the, the inflated prices. So here's what you do in the corporate world. You lie about the company's assets and its profit, profitability. You talk about how you're, you're having this new line that's going to make this new town in this area and you already have these sweet deals with these other uh, corporations and whatnot for, for shipping rates and all this other stuff. But you just lie. You make the company sound a lot better than it is. This makes the stock price go up because it creates a demand for it and then you sell at that high price and then you get the hell out of there. And when the, the returns don't manifest, that stock price is going to plummet but you're, you're long gone. Another way that the railroad companies... Uh, made money illegally was they formed a pool and a pool is an agreement between uh, several companies uh, to divide the business in a given area and share the profits so they would split up we'll say Illinois and say okay this company you're gonna control all the railroad traffic in Chicago uh, company B you're gonna control all the railroad traffic you know in central Illinois and co company C you're gonna control the traffic in uh, uh, in southern Illinois and so you you're basically agreeing not to compete with each other and you're oftentimes agreeing on the shipping rates and then you're just going to pool then your profits together which is very good from the business standpoint but if you're a consumer this sucks because what you want is you want competition uh, 
competition, they're, it's going to drive prices down, and that's not going to happen in a pool agreement. Another one are, are secret rebates and kickbacks, which were given to powerful shippers. Uh, you're going to see like Rockefeller and Carnegie, they're able to get uh, like secret deals to ship their stuff on the railroads uh, at a much, much cheaper rate. And the, the small farmer was not going to get this rate, and so he usually paid the highest rate as a result. And we talked a little bit about this during the last chapter with the, the Populist Party. They felt that the, the farmers who made up the Populist Party were getting screwed by the railroads. And that's why they wanted uh, the government to own the railroads. I've never had a problem with these rebates because it just makes sense. The, the railroads are getting something in return. They're getting guaranteed shipping at a large volume at a leg regular rate. So this is they can they can plan ahead. Corporations love to be able to plan ahead, uh, whereas the farmers, you know, he may only use the railroad twice a year, right, to to ship his harvest out and to ship his grain his seed in and, and six months later. So he doesn't deserve the the sweet rate that a big shipper should. You know, think about it this way: if you purchase a bag of candy at Seven Eleven, you're going to expect to pay more than buying a big box. Of the of bags of that candy at a place like Sam's Club or Costco, it's it it's power buying, right? It's it's you get more for your buck when you buy more, and so I didn't I don't I really don't see a problem with these secret rebates, but the working class during this time period evidently disagreed with me. And here's a pull cartoon advancing that uh, standpoint. Here you can see big business monopoly. Sitting on the Union Pacific, the public be damned. There's the smoke of oppression, and of course, who are they holding up and running over? Justice, industry, a miner, a mechanic, a merchant, right? And they have the power of the U.S. Army behind them. So this is obviously very. This is a Zen-like uh, political cartoon here depicting the railroad. The government does. Uh, attempt to stop some of these uh, unsavory business practices. At least they're paying lip service to them. And it's probably because they just want the public to believe they're doing that uh, because th they don't actually do anything other than, than pass these laws that are laws in name only. And the first one is the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. It prohibited rebates and pools and it required the publishing of rates. So it's no more of those secret. Uh, rates in between the company and one railroad, or vice versa. Uh, it also creates the Interstate Commerce Commission, otherwise known as the ICC, to enforce this legislation. Now, that's pretty much all you need to know about this. Uh, but I have here in that bullet point, this is almost always how it's tested. It's the first large-scale attempt by Washington to shift away from laissez-faire in order to regulate business in the interest of society. Remember, prior to the Interstate Commerce Act, uh, the government did absolutely nothing to interfere with business. You know, think about the the Supreme Court cases that we've already read, with uh, McCullough versus Maryland, Marbury versus Madison, where all of those Federalist opinions by John Marshall they all aided big business. And here now is, at least on paper, an attempt by the federal government to intervene itself in between big business and the individual. Now, there are so many loopholes uh, that it really doesn't do anything, and the railroads pretty much you know, went on business as usual. But at least on paper, uh, there, there's some sort of government intervention, and it definitely, definitely builds upon this in the subsequent 100 years. Now, we're filled with regulations. Uh, this is kind of a placeholder slide here. I have here the miracles of mechanization. So I already talked about that there's tons and tons of foreign capital flowing into the United States. And, you know, that in, in addition to capital, you have tons and tons of uh, immigrants from Europe who are flooding into the country. And in addition to this, then, you have all of these new technological innovations that create new businesses that feed more industrialization that demand more capital, that demand more labor, labor. So you can see how it all kind of feeds on itself. And so now we're going to talk about what some of those uh, innovations. 
Okay, the first big one we're going to talk about is the perfection of the light bulb in 1879 by Thomas Edison there on the right. Thomas Edison, uh, he actually probably wasn't a genius, uh, although he has tons and tons of patents. He was what is known as a tinkerer, but he was smart enough to form a corporation and fill it with other scientists and tinkerers. And then anything that they invented, he, of course, got the patent for because he was the, the owner of that corporation. So tons and tons and tons of patents are attributed to him in name, although the real the work was done by some of his employees. But the real the perfection, they had crude light bulbs before this, but what they didn't have was a, a filament, a proper filament. And this is what his company did, is they figured out the 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 width and the uh, type of metal to use in there. And it was just through trial and error. Uh, but it, it really revolutionized uh, the world because now you're not trapped with you know gas-lit material that you can have a much safer way of lighting up uh, the darkness. And so it really it changes cities. It changes uh, habits of, of people that you can really, it's feasible to stay awake and do stuff after dark now. Another one of Edison's uh, um, inventions is the phonograph, which is a very, very early version of record player or CD player or an MP3 player. So this is the, the great-great-grandfather of, uh, of your MP3 player now, 1877. The Edaphone or Dictaphone. Uh, this is the, the first kind of recording device. So here is how you use it, similar to a microphone. It's not how I'm using my microphone right now, but you know, to each his own. And uh, you speak into that or play music into that, and then record it on these these spools down here. And here is actually a pope, and here's his his dictaphone. Um, I'm not sure which pope it is. It doesn't really matter, but he's famous in that he recorded some Christmas mass. Uh, during this time period, and then it would, these things were distributed all across the world, and uh, churches all over the place then were able to play and hear the Pope's voice for the first time. The motion picture camera. Uh, and originally, Edison uh, invented this just as a way of showing off how cool his light bulb was, and to try and increase sales of his light bulb. And so he took a bunch of photos uh, of something uh, moving and each photo was like a you know a half second picture of this movement and then he put them on a strip and then he put this this really l bright light bulb in front of him and then he put the, the strip on a, on a reel right and then he made the reel go and what it does is you you see then the stop action movement of the, the of the picture I think it was like a dance or something like that and was, but people really thought that that was cool and then artists um, realized the, the potential to, you know, you could tell an actual story then using this. So this is the very first uh, movie. Okay, shifting away from Edison, we got here the very, very first telephone. So the, the very first phone looked like this. Now, there's a big dispute as to when it was invented and who it was invented by. Uh, your book and the AP test has decided that it's Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. So there you go. If you want to know more, look it up. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some of these super rich dudes and how they became super rich. We already talked about Vanderbilt, who becomes mega rich thanks to the railroad. Uh, then there's Andrew Carnegie, who becomes mega rich in the steel industry. John D. Rockefeller, who does this in the oil industry, and J.P. Morgan, who does this in, in banking. And these guys and others devised legal and illegal ways to circumvent competition. Because remember, you, you want, as a business owner, you don't want competition. You want to maximize your profits and minimize your costs. The first way is actually... 100% legal. There's no no problems with this, and it's called vertical integration. What you do is you combine into one organization all phases of manufacturing, from mining to marketing. So if you are going to make, you know, a, a pen, then you're going to have to get that 
plastic from somewhere. You're going to have to get that ink from somewhere. You're going to have to get the metal components from somewhere. And if you own the places that you get that stuff from and you own the means of transportation to get those components to your factory, you own the factory that creates the pen, you own perhaps the stores. And when you own uh, the means of production, the means of distribution, all that stuff from top to bottom, then you don't have to pay any profits to any of the middlemen. You, the, the only profit that is obtained is when you sell it to the end consumer. So you're able to control the, perfectly the quality that you want, and you don't have to pay any profits to, to anybody whatsoever. So uh, McDonald's nowadays does this to, to a big degree. Uh, with the, the lettuce, the tomatoes, the cheese, the the, the beef, <laughs> the uh, uh, the bread, they, they pretty much own all aspects of that, all the way up until uh, you stuff it in your fat face. Horizontal integration. Another word for this is just a monopoly, and this is where you own as many uh, competitors, or you're the only competitor uh, around. This is a, this was a problem in the 1990s with Microsoft, actually where pretty much every computer uh, had Windows on it. And if you played with Windows the right way and you did whatever Bill Gates said, then your software would be compatible with Windows. And if you didn't, it was not compatible with Windows and you're basically your software is unusable anywhere then. Uh, and it was great because it was a, a slick move on, on Microsoft's part because they new computers, of course, got Windows for free. But if you wanted an update, you had to pay hundreds of dollars. And there's really no other place to go. So eventually, they had such a huge share and were so uh, dominant that uh, governments around the world basically started to sue Microsoft and say, you need to you know, cut that out. Uh, other ways to create uh, a monopoly without being caught, really, are to have, are, you can have a trust where the stockholders from your competitors actually assign their stock to a central board of directors, which of course you control. So even though you have competitors, the, their stock basically belongs to you. So you profit off of your competitors. Another way to do that is called interlocking directorates. And this is where you place your officers, your loyal employees, uh, it, from your dominant company onto the the boards of directors of your competitors, and so now you get to control the decisions that your competitors make. This is a graphic organizer uh, showing vertical integration and horizontal integration. This one depicts the oil industry, so you can see if you owned all of the oil wells, that would be horizontal integration, and that would be an illegal monopoly. But if you own just a couple wells, you owned a couple of the transportation uh, mechanisms, you own the ref a couple of refineries, you own some more of the transportation, and you own some gas stations or you know kerosene distributors or something like that, then that would be called vertical integration, and that is 100% okay. So this is what Carnegie does with US Steel and this is what Nelson or what John D Rockefeller does with the Standard Oil Company this was legal this was illegal actually Rockefeller did it with refining so it'd be up here and there's a political cartoon about the Standard Oil Company and you can see the many tentacles of this leviathan and it's got a stranglehold over the Capitol building, and I don't know another Capitol building, and it's a poised over the White House. All right, shifting now to Carnegie and the steel industry. Andrew Carnegie is a true rags to riches story. He came to America as a very very poor Scottish boy, and started out with just the absolutely crappy. Uh, child labor type jobs but because he worked so hard because he was willing to accept more and larger responsibility because he was very cheap and saved his money uh, he kept getting 
you know, promote it, promote it, promote it. And then when he becomes a man, uh, he, you know, invests in this new steel industry. And it was a new steel industry because of the Bessemer process. There had been crude forms of steel for a long, long time, but it was very expensive to make, and it wasn't of a high quality. I'm not going to go into the chemistry behind it, but they developed something called the Bessemer process, where you know, as you're making the steel out of the different uh, metal elements, uh, you blow cold air on it. And apparently this then ignites the carbon inside the, the ore and burns away the carbon. And what you get then is a, a very pure, very strong uh, end product of steel. And there, apparently it's much cheaper to do it also. So because you're able to make a, a cheaper material that's of a higher quality, than iron, uh, it really creates a, a huge market for steel. And Carnegie saw this, and so he invested heavily into this, and he becomes, you know, mega rich uh, in the steel industry. He's he's also one of the first um, big charitable contributors. You know, there's currently we got like the we we're just talking about Windows with Bill Gates. There's the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that now spend hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to eradicate loathsome diseases like AIDS uh, around the world. And also they are, you know, they, they just pump in tons and tons and tons of money into education. Warren Buffett's another guy. He's really old, really rich, and he just donated almost all of his money to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Well, this is really kind of created by Andrew Carnegie, who once he retires in the early 1900s, uh, he goes about and then donates almost all of his wealth uh, to the arts, to the sciences, uh, all over the country. All right, switching to oil. The first product in the oil industry was actually kerosene. Uh, I think it's because it's it's much easier to distill gasoline than, or kerosene than it is other uh, petroleum products. And so when they start doing this in the mid 1800s, it pretty much kills the the whaling industry because whalers have been you know hunting in order to get whale oil because that was what was made turned into the lamps and so people when they would light their their houses or their businesses uh with whale oil this then shifts to kerosene which is good because the whales weren't hunted to uh, extinction the kerosene industry is almost eradicated, though, by Edison's light bulb in the 1880s. Um, the, the oil industry is reinvigorated, though, right around the 20th century, the turn of the 20th century, with the, the birth of the automobile industry. And Rockefeller is, you know, in charge during this entire uh, process. He organizes the Standard Oil Company in 1870. And by 1877, he controls 95% of all of the oil refineries in the United States. Crude oil is fine, and other people would own oil wells, but you can't do really anything with crude oil. You have to turn it into something. And the way that you turn it into something is you have to refine it. And Rockefeller saw that that's where uh, he could make his money, is in the refining of that oil. Because if you have a barrel of oil and you want to you know, make money off of it, you're going to have to refine it, and you're going to have to go to Rockefeller to do so. And there's Rockefeller staring at his, his minions and his money in the White House there. And you can see the Capitol building surrounded by oil barrels, and you've got the smokestacks coming out of the Capitol, and there's the Treasury Department, and there's Rockefeller, bigger than everybody, staring at his, at his wealth. There's another pill cartoon, very zen-like, where you got many of these robber barons. Notice how they're all fat, big dollar signs on their bellies. And there's their names, the Fields Millions, the Goulds Millions, Vanderbilt. And how are they supported? They're supported on the working man's back, surrounded by the, the sea of hard times. Okay, so we talked a little bit about Carnegie distributing his money, and he he believed in something called the gospel of wealth, and they are they do test you on this a lot. The idea of the gospel of wealth is that Carnegie and others recognized that he had a huge uh, piece of the pie, and as such, 
he needs to act morally responsible with that. And so that's why when he retired, he distributed uh, his money to, to what he saw as uh, useful means. On the other hand, on the other side of the spectrum, though, were the social Darwinists. And they felt that the wealthy became wealthy because they were smarter and were more hardworking than the poor. It kind of ties into the whole survival of the fittest theory. And so they didn't feel that the poor should be helped at all. In fact, the, the poor, if they die off, oh well, they'll be more poor. And this theory by the social Darwinists is later applied to explain as to why some countries are more dominant than others and why some countries have the right to you know, control other countries. And then this really turns into a race-based thing um, where the, you know, we, we get to basically Nazi Germany eventually. Now, we already talked about that the, the government really believed in laissez-faire economics at this time period. And there were certain constitutional mechanisms that corporate lawyers were able to utilize um, to show that laissez-faire was the philosophy of the government. The two big ones were the Commerce Clause, which is an Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution. And this gives Congress sole jurisdiction over interstate commerce. Remember, we talked about this with McCullough versus Maryland and with uh, Gibbons v. Ogden. Now, in addition, at the 14th Amendment, which was very new during this time period, um, and whenever you have a new amendment, uh, the Supreme Court really needs to kind of interpret it and weigh in on it. And they interpreted the 14th Amendment as granting corporations status as individuals. So in the eyes of the law, a corporation is a person. And because a corporation is a person, you cannot deprive it of its life, its liberty, or its property without due process of law. And remember, the 14th Amendment was, was put in place to stop states from abusing individual rights. Now remember, originally it was designed to protect uh, African Americans. But because of the interpretation by the Supreme Court, states could not deprive a corporation of property without due process of law. If you couple that with the Commerce Clause, which says that the federal government is the only one that gets to regulate interstate commerce, and these corporations are all doing business across state lines, so they're engaging in interstate commerce, it really puts uh, the brakes on any type of state action to try and curb big business. So states were trying to put in eight-hour workday laws, uh, minimum wage laws, anti uh, monopoly type laws within the boundaries of their states and then corporate lawyers will run to the nearest federal court and say no 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 you can't do that because of the 14th amendment and the commerce clause and for the most part these federal judges would agree with them so that's uh really any type of state regulation of these businesses is really halted until the 20th century now, the federal government, again, though, has to pay lip surface to the voters because the voters, these are the guys that are working in the factories and they're not happy about this. So they want protection. And this is what's going on here is the rich have been getting lots richer and the poor have been getting poorer. And you can see here, this is two pictures from your book of a rich family, typical day at a rich family's house, and typical day at a poor family's house where they're doing even more work uh, in order to feed themselves. Although... She doesn't look like she's missed too many meals. And the daughter there, well, she, she's well on her way of looking like her mom. So the, the government does pay lip service, though, uh, initially to tackling these trusts with the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. And on paper, it forbade combinations in restraint of trade. So in other words, it's, it, it sounds like it's anti-monopoly. However, who writes this law? the lobbyists from these big corporations. And so it's filled with loopholes that they can get around. And the congressmen who voted on this were, of course, in the pockets of these big businesses. So it was ineffective at attacking big business. In actuality, it has the opposite effect, and it's used to attack the working class. Because now, if workers at a factory want to form a union and go on strike, well, then that factory is going to have to close down uh, or slow down for the duration of that strike. And so what would happen is the corporate attorneys then would sue the union, sue the workers, and get the government's help. And 
the government agreed, and the government said that unions, early unions, were illegal when they went on strike because they violated the Sherman Antitrust Act because they were a combination of individuals who were agreeing to halt trade. So it had the exact opposite effect as its public intentions. This really isn't uh, fixed until uh, the progressive era of the, the 19 teens. This is just a map from your book, I think it's your book, of uh, what the different industries look like in the United States. I'm not going to go into great detail, although your chapter does, of uh, bitching that the, the South has no industry. But you can really see that here. There's really no industry in the South until the 1950s. Uh, most of the, the factories are on the East Coast in what now is known as the Rust Belt, of which Chicago is part of. So you get Cleveland, that's where uh, Rockefeller had most of his refineries, uh, Detroit, which turns into the big auto industry, and then for us uh, is the, the slaughterhouse in the meatpacking industry, and also the steel industry as well, but Pittsburgh was involved in that. So now we're going to shift uh, from focusing on big business to now the working class and the rise of the labor movement, the, the earliest unions. And it is because of the problems that are created by uh, the second industrial revolution of, you know, you're creating these need for jobs. You can see here are breaker boys from your book. and Here's some early textile mill uh, workers here, also children. Um, it's very menial labor, meaning that there's really no skill involved. Uh, other than you know doing something with your hands or your feet, and as a result, if you get injured, you just get fired. If you get sick, you just get fired. If you don't show up for work, you just get fired because there was such a huge increase of the population that you're easily replaceable for you know an unskilled job like this. And so you know the, you got paid terribly, and the working conditions were also awful. And yet the population is really shifting to those types of jobs. As you can see, in, in the mid-1800s, almost everybody's a farmer. And by the 1900s, lots and lots of people are working in the factories. And what's the what's the wealth? Or not the wealth. What's the power? If you want to complain as a worker to the corporation, what's your power compared to uh, the corporation? And that's what this pull cartoon dictates, right? All he's got is he's swinging a hammer, and this definitely isn't Thor's hammer. And he's riding on a horse named Poverty, right? And he's competing against here big business. You know, it's kind of like if you want to complain about something that's going on at Carmel, what is your power as a student? And this is basically you right here. So... Here I set up a table that shows you the powers of management, so that'd be the who owns the company and, and runs the company, and then the powers of the worker, so the tools of labor, management versus labor. And you can see it was during this time period, it was very, very one-sided in favor of the company. Uh, if the people went on strike, the, the company could just hire scabs. If they were, if it was unskilled labor, it's so easy to turn to train a new employee to do move this pile to this pile, that type of thing. Uh, management could engage in a public relations campaign. They probably already owned uh, the local media, and so they can make it appear that the, the, the workers are being greedy. Uh, the company could hire the Pinkertons. Remember, these were like domestic mercenaries, and they could be hired to uh, beat up, really, the, the guys who were going on strike. You could engage in a lockout. This is actually what happened in the Chicago Public Schools. Uh, a year or two ago, where uh, management just locked the doors and said to the employees, no, screw you guys, um, go home uh, until you change your mind, you quit your bitching. Uh, blacklisting, you can target the leader of these unions or, or all of the workers and distribute their names around to all your competitors, and your competitors don't want them either. And so the, these individuals aren't going to get hired anywhere. Uh, court injunctions. Remember that the government is definitely siding with big business, and so you could have a, a judge actually, you know, give a court order forcing people to go back to work. An open shop where you just declare uh, no unions are allowed in in this organization, and that's coupled with the yellow dog contracts, where once a new employee 
is hired, he is forced to sign an agreement that's, that says that he will not go on strike and he will not uh, form a union. And if he violates that, then you can sue him for breach of contract. On the other side are the powers of the uh, the workers. Uh, they can engage in boycotts. Right? This is just where we try and get people not to buy the products of that company. Worked very well during the Revolutionary Era, if you remember. There are sympathy demonstrations where you're – it's kind of tied with informational picketing. And you kind of see this a lot nowadays even, again, with the, the, the teachers union in Chicago where they may not go on strike – but they get their faces in front of the cameras to, to complain about the issues that they feel that they're uh, being harmed by. A closed shop, where you get the, the business owner to agree to only hire uh, union workers. And then, of course, lastly, and probably the most uh, effective means, is an organized strike, otherwise known as like a, a walkout, where you, you say, we're not working until you change something. But especially during uh, the 1800s, much more power was with the the companies as opposed to the workers. There's a uh, striker confronting a scab picture from your book. That's that's about to to get ugly there. So the, the workers start to form unions, and there's a lot of them. And they, they peter out quick. And so we're only going to focus in on two or three of the big ones. The The National Labor Union starts in 1866, and it tries to be a union for all, basically all working class workers. Um, and with the panic of 1873, where lots of people go unemployed and lots of businesses close, this pretty much kills the National Labor Union. From its ashes, uh, the Knights of Labor in the late 1870s are, are born. And the Knights of Labor, they're led by that guy there, Terrence Powderly, sweet mustache. And they end up being the first, uh, I'm going to say semi-powerful labor union in the nation. They sought to include all workers in the one big union. This includes skilled mechanics, so the type of guys who fix these uh, complicated machines over here, but then also the unskilled workers. Right, the guys who are just mining in the in the mines, or you know, adding spools of thread to these machines, uh, and and then ends up being a, a strategic error, and the Knights of Labor are killed basically for for two reasons. They are associated, perhaps unfairly, with the Haymarket Square riot here in Chicago in 1886, um, where there there was a strike going on at. Uh, the, the McCormick Reaper Works, and there was a demonstration, and some cops showed up to probably crack some skulls, and somebody threw a bomb and killed some cops. And so what happens is uh, some people are arrested. There's a big issue. They're, they're sentenced to death and all this other stuff. You don't need to know those details. But in the eyes of the public, those anarchists, right, those, those evil individuals who did this to the police, were associated with the Knights of Labor. So then the Knights of Labor gets associated with anarchists and this type like this violent type of action. In addition to that, if a skilled worker goes on strike, it's tough for the company to replace him because there's only so many skilled workers. In order to create a skilled worker, you have to sink a lot of training involved and that takes time. However, if an unskilled worker goes on strike he's easily replaced and so the the unskilled labor were easily replaced with scabs and this hurt the the leverage the negotiating power of the knights of labor so eventually they just kind of peter out but here's his famous saying an injury to one is the concern of all now what were the goals of the knights of labor Eight-hour workday. Instead of working 16, 17 hours a day, right? Now, cut that down to eight-hour workdays. Workers' cooperatives, worker-owned factories, abolition of child and prison labor, increased circulation of greenbacks. This is a very populist party type of thing. Uh, Equal pay for men and women, safety codes in the workplace, prohibition of contract foreign labor, the ticker jobs, right? They're trying to uh, decrease... The, the power of the company to replace them with cheap foreigners. 
sound contemporary, perhaps. Abolition of the National Bank. These are all kind of stuff, right, that uh, Andrew Jackson, his supporters were in favor of, um, you know, 50 years prior to this, with the exception of that the, the industrial era hadn't been so prevalent. But you can see what's going on here. The poor have oftentimes wanted this stuff, and the rich want to keep it from them. It's a very Zinn Schweikart type thing. Zinn loves the, the labor movement and unions and all that other stuff. So after the, the kind of the death of the, the Knights of Labor, uh, you get the American Federation of Labor, the AFL. And in fact, the AFL is still around today. It's merged with the CIO. It's usually the AFL-CIO now. And here's the guy that founds them. His name is Samuel Gompers. He had the bright idea of saying, screw you, unskilled worker. We're only unionizing uh, the, the skilled laborers. And it's a federation of unions. So it's not just a single, it's like a union for skilled worker unions. And so an individual union within uh, this federation can go on strike, but it will be supported by uh, the rest of the unions. And this this has a much greater influence on uh, on big. You can hear it catered to the skilled worker. Um, it also represented workers in the matter of some national legislation. What I mean by that is the FFL would hire lobbyists and would you know they would bribe uh, a congressman, uh, maintain a national strike fund, so. You would contribute to this, and then if your union went on strike, uh, the AFL would would help, you know, pay the bills, so to speak. Evangelize the cause of unionism. Said unions are great. Uh, prevented disputes among the unions. Mediated disputes between management and labor, and pushed for closed shops. So really pushed for that uh, that factory that that you work in. It's only going to hire union workers. There's Samuel Gompers, picture from your book, uh, marching in Washington. This guy looks so happy to be there, doesn't he? And finally, the last slide, under an hour. Um, we have 1862, Congress authorizes the Transcontinental Railroad. The National Union organizes in 1866. You get the first transatlantic telegraph cable. 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad is completed. The Knights of Labor also are organized there. Uh, Standard Oil is organized in 1870. Bell invents the telephone in 1876. Edison invents the light bulb in 1879. 1886, you get the Haymarket bombing, and you get the AFL formed. 1887, the Interstate Commerce Act. 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act. And then U.S. Steel Corporation is formed in 1901.